Good morning. Good morning. Nice to be here today. I'd like to sit. Nice to see you all in the house of the Lord this morning and come together to, to worship Jesus in spirit and in truth. Scripture lesson today is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, 1 through 21. The Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 21st verse. John 3, beginning at the third chapter, first verse. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God has sent him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, one cannot enter the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everything, everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you can do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son unto the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Besides, he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, the light that comes down into the world and people Love the darkness rather than the light because they their works were evil. For everyone does what is true comes to end to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his work has been carried out in God. Thus in the reading of God's holy word, may he bless his truth to our hearts. May we be with God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we 
come to thee this morning with bowed heads and open hearts. We come to you remembering how great, how strong, how loving you are. And we remember our Father, how evil we are. Forgive us our sins, our Father, that we might be washed and made clean as a new cloth of snow. Help us, our Father, as we struggle in life. Help us as we seek to serve you daily in our lives. And help us to be more like the disciples of Jesus. Help us to look to you for every aspect of our lives. When we come to make those difficult decisions, let us ask your opinion, your help, your guidance. When we go about our daily chores, let us look to you for our strength. Father, we just pray that you will be with us always, 24 hours a day, 365 hours a day. And that you, we thank you that you are only a prayer away. We can come to you. And we know that you listen. We know that you hear our prayers. And Father, help us when we pray to remember to listen to what you have to say to us. Help us to not be demanding, but help us to be seeking your help. Father, we thank you for this great nation that we live in. We pray that each of us will do our part in turning this nation back to one nation under God. We thank you for our great military. We ask you to bless them and keep them strong that they will be able to protect us. We pray for those that are in harm's way. Keep them safe, our Father that they may be returned to us, both physically and mentally strong. Father, we pray for those of the number that have problems. We pray especially for Sandy. We ask our Father, your healing hand, be upon her. Be with her during the healing process, and may it be safe and great. Be with the Benry family that has lost loved ones with sorrow of the passing of Shirley. We know our Father that she is now united with Jim in heaven. And we're thankful for that. We thank you for the, for the ones that are mentioned here today, our Father. Be with them, help them, heal them. Be good to them as you are to us. Father, we ask you to be with us now. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable unto thee, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. There was a boy named Paul who lived out in the Pacific Northwest. He was just a little boy when his family became the proud owners of one of the first telephones in the neighborhood. You know, it was one of those old wooden boxes with the speaker on front and the earphone you had to take off and the crank on the side. Those of you that are older like me can remember that we have used them, but uh, the younger ones wouldn't know what I'm talking about. They're, they're not one you can hold in your hand. Anyhow, Paul listened and was really fascinated as his parents were talking on the phone. And he uh, was discovered one day that there's somewhere inside that wonderful device called a telephone lived an amazing person. Her name was Information, please. And there was nothing she did not know. She knew all the information. She could supply anyone's number and throughout the time of the day, anytime. Paul's first experience 
with information, please, came one day when he whacked his finger with a hammer. He was home alone, and he was terribly, terribly upset, and he didn't know what to do. And then he thought of the telephone. Quickly, he pulled over a stool so he could be up high enough to talk into it, lifted up the receiver and set into the phone, information, please. Pretty soon, he heard a voice answer. Information, please. A very small and clear voice. Paul said, I hurt my finger. And he was crying and crying. And the information, please, said, is it bleeding? And Paul said, no, I hit it with a hammer and it hurts, it hurts. And she said, can you open the ice box? And he said, yeah. And she said, get a piece of ice, and put it on the finger, and that will help. Paul did that, and it helped him a lot. After that, Paul called information leads for everything. She helped him with his geography, with his math. She taught him how to spell the word fix. She told him what to feed his pet chipmunk. And when Paul's pet canary died, she listened to his grief tenderly and then said, Paul, remember. Remember that there are other worlds to sing in. Somehow that made Paul feel better. Paul was nine years old when his family moved from the northeast to Boston. And he missed having his conversations with information, please. Some years passed, Paul was on his way out west to go to college. His plane landed in Seattle. And he dialed his hometown operator and said, information please. Miraculously, this, he heard the same small, clear voice that he had known so well as a child. Information, she said. Paul hadn't planned this, but suddenly he blurted out, could you please tell me how to fill, spell the word fix? There was a long pause on the other end, and then came a soft answer. I guess your finger must have healed by now. Paul laughed. So it's really still you, he said. Do you have any idea how much you meant to me during the time when I was a small boy? I wonder, she said, if you know how much your cause meant to me. I never had any children, and I used to look forward to your calls so much. Paul told her that he had missed her over the years, and he asked if he could call her again when he was back in that area. And she said, please do. Just ask for Sally. Well, three months later, Paul was back in that Seattle, and this time he dialed the phone, and a different voice answered him. And he asked for Sally. And the voice on the other end said, are you a friend? Yes, a dear old friend, Paul answered. Well, she said, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but Sally had been working part time for the last few years because she was sick. And five weeks ago, she passed away. Before you gonna hang up the opera, the front of the operator said, wait a minute, did you say your name was Paul? Yes, well Sally left a message for you. She wrote it down in case you called. Let me read it to you. It says, when Paul calls, tell him that I still say there are other worlds to sing in. He will know what I mean. Paul thought 
lantern, hung up the phone, and he did know what Sally meant. There are other worlds to sing in. Isn't that a beautiful and powerful thought? And that is precisely what John 3 is all about. There are other worlds to sing in, in this life and beyond this life in the next life. When Jesus said to Nicodemus that night, he must be born again, he must be born from above, that's what he meant. You don't have to stay the way you are. You can make a new start. You can have a new life. You can become a new person. There are other worlds to sing in. Remember the story of Nicodemus. He was a key leader among the Jews. He was probably from a wealthy, distinguished, and highly respected family. He was a Pharisee, one of the brotherhood of 6,000, who had taken a pledge in front of three witnesses that they would dedicate their lives to observing every detail of the scribal law. Scribes worked out the regulations and the Pharisees consecrated their lives to keeping them to the nth degree. In addition, Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin was the court for the Jews. The Sanhedrin had only 70 members out of the 6,000 Pharisees. The top 70 made up the Sanhedrin jury, and Nicodemus was one of these people. The Sanhedrin had religious authority over every Jew in the world. And one of the primary duties was to examine and to deal with anyone suspected of being a false prophet. I think his demons came to visit Jesus by night. Why did he do that? Well, very much ink has been spoiled over this reason. Why did he come by night? Was he afraid? of the guilt by association? Was he fearful of what his Pharisee colleagues might think? Or was it just that he wanted a private audience with Jesus? Was he coming as a watchdog on the Sanhedrin? Or was he genuinely interested in coming as to get to know Jesus better? All of these things are fascinating questions. But what is amazing here is that he came at all. His Pharisees' friends would have scoffed at his thought. After all, Jesus was not one of them. And besides that, they were extremely suspicious of him. They had labeled him a troublemaker who was upsetting the people. They were looking for an opportunity to silence him. They saw Jesus as a threat. But Nicodemus came to him and Nicodemus said to him, Rabbi, you must be a teacher who has come from God because you, no one could do the signs and wonders you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus responded to Nicodemus by saying to him, you can't see the kingdom of God without being born again. You must be born from above. This means that you can't become a Christian by making a few minor adjustments to your life. It must be a complete turnaround, a radical rebirth a rebirth from above, which of course means a new life with God. Nicodemus didn't understand this. He didn't get it at all. So Jesus explained with what may be called the greatest verse 
in the whole Bible. John 3, 16, which every one of those, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that anyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Some years ago, the great boxer Muhammad Ali was asked by a ghetto youth how he could quit school and become a boxer and start a boxing career. Since his grades were bad, he didn't think he could make it in school and he wanted to quit and become a boxer. Ali just smiled at the man and said in his poetic fashion, Stay in college and get the knowledge and stay there till you're through. Because if God can make penicillin out of moldy bread, he can make something out of you. And that's true. This is the great news of John 3. Because God so loved the world, he sent his only son to make something out of us. When we accept him into our lives and we commit our hearts to him, then he gives us new life in the world and in the new world to come. That's what it means to be born again or born from above. But let me be more specific and describe this new birth with three thoughts. You will think of other thoughts, and I know there are a lot more different ways you can approach this. But let me try these three on for size this morning. First of all, born from above means it comes alive to the Bible. It comes alive to the Bible. In his book, Biblical Proclamation of Africa Today, John Wesley tells a wonderful story of a, a young woman who had heard people talking about a very interesting new book that had just been published. Everybody raved about it, how great it was. So she went to the bookstore and she found a book and she bought a copy and she brought it home and she took it out and she tried to read it. But somehow she just couldn't get into it. I know you've probably all done the same thing. I've done that myself. I've got books at home. I've just tried to read and I just can't get into them. She just couldn't get into it. She would read a little, and then she put the book aside. It did not capture her attention. A few months later, the young woman was traveling to a foreign country. She met a very handsome young man, and she fell in love with him. As they spent time together, she discovered that he was a writer. And would you believe it? He was the author of that book that everyone was talking about back home. The one she had brought home and tried to read, but couldn't get into it. When she returned home, she found the book, started reading it again, and this time she couldn't put it down. She read it from cover to cover. And then she read it again and again. It was the most exhilarating book she had ever read in her life. Now, what was the difference? Simply this. She had met the author. She knew him personally. He was her friend indeed. She was in love with him. This story is a wonderful parable for what it means to come alive to the Bible. If we don't know Jesus personally, the Bible is hard to read, difficult to get into, easy to put aside. But when we know Jesus Christ personally and intimately, then we feel his love and return his love. Then the Bible becomes alive for us. It becomes a love letter from God. It becomes the most exciting book that we have ever read in our entire life. 
There's a fascinating thing to notice about Nicodemus. He knew his scriptures well. But for him, being religious meant knowing what to do and especially what not to do. The emphasis of this Bible study was on what people do, but Jesus changed all of that. He said that in order to see the kingdom of God, the emphasis must shift to what God does. The New Testament makes it clear about the new birth. It is not our doing. It is born from above. It is God's gift to us. We can't earn it. We can only accept it by faith. So to be born from above means to come alive to the Bible by falling in love with the author and finisher of our faith. Secondly, to be born from above means to come alive to love. A little girl went to the doctor to be examined. When the doctor came into the examining room, she held up both hands to stop him. And wait a minute. And she says, Doctor, I know what you're going to do. You're going to do five things. You're going to check my eyes, my ears, my nose, my throat, and my heart. The doctor smiled and said, Well, Sarah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Is there any particular order that I should do this today? And Sarah said, Well, you can do this order any way you want to, but if I were you, I would start with the heart. That's what Jesus did, wasn't it? He started with the heart. He started with love. And that is precisely what he wants each of us to do. Nicodemus and his Pharisee friends had a hard time with that because they had been taught all their lives to start with all those laws and those rules and those regulations and those restrictions. For example, if a man fell into a hole on the Sabbath day and he was screaming for help, the Pharisee would say, what does the law say about this? Well, the law says you cannot work on the Sabbath day. So his response was, sorry, can't help you today. Maybe somebody will come by tomorrow and help you. On the other hand, Jesus would start with the heart and he would say to this man in the hole, give me your hand and I'll pull you out. That night in Jerusalem, long ago, Jesus was saying to Nicodemus and eventually to us, you don't have to stay where you are. You don't have to be a prisoner of liberty. There are other worlds to sing in. You can be reborn from above. You can come alive to the Bible. You can come alive to love. Give me your hand, Nicodemus. I'll pull you out. Thirdly and finally, to begin to, to be born from above means to come alive to eternal life. For the Christian, death is not death at all. It is just the end of life on this earth. It is simply moving through a door called death into a new dimension with our Lord Jesus Christ and God's response. Perhaps you've heard of Henry Van Dyke's parable of immortality. It is a powerful parable on how we see death and how death really should be viewed. Listen to his words. I am standing on the seashore. 
A ship by my side spreads her white sails in the morning breeze and starts for the blue ocean. She is an object of beauty and strength, and I stand and watch until at last she hangs like a speck of white cloud just where the sea and the sky come together. Then someone by my side says, there she goes, she's gone, gone from my sight. That is all. She is just as large and the mast is as big as ever. She's large in her hull and her span. She's just as large as when she left my side and just as able to bear her load of living freight to the place of their destination. Her diminished size is not, is in me, not in her. And just at the moment when someone at my side says, there she goes, their eyes watching her coming, other voices ready to take up the glad shout. Here she comes, here she comes, over on the other shore. This is the good news of the Christian faith. We can be born again into this life. We can be born again yet when death comes because there are other worlds to save in. When we commit our lives to Jesus Christ, God will always be there for us, even on the other side of the grave. We can shout on that because we know that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Being born from above means many things, but for sure it means accepting Christ into our lives as our personal Savior and through him coming alive to the Bible coming alive to Christ-like love, coming alive to eternal life. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your written word that we can know more of you and your kingdom. We thank thee, our Father, that you have said you have loved us so much that you gave your only Son for us. Help us, our fallen, to think of that personally. You gave your son Jesus for me and for each of those here today. Help us to remember that, our Father. We thank thee for just being our Father and being near to us. And we thank you for the story of Nicodemus that we can know more of you and your heavenly kingdom. Father, we ask that we read your word, know your word, and accept your word, and follow you daily in our hearts. That each of us might come to know Jesus Christ. In Christ's holy name I pray. Amen.